So um, before we get started, this is a neat day because tomorrow, actually, July uh, 2016, is the 60th anniversary of the field of artificial intelligence, which began in Dartmouth in 1956. And uh, we're going to talk about AI broadly. And uh, what, what's neat about Gil Pratt, who's at Toyota, is he's someone who's actually spent a lot of time building these things that walk around and move around in the world, which I think is still a little bit unusual. And he was involved in, you know, as a reporter um, over the last 12 years, um, the Pentagon's think tank, DARPA, has sponsored these two con conferences, uh, contests, um, two grand challenges to build autonomous systems. One was, was, one was cars and the other was robots. And for me, they sort of represent ground truth about where the field really is, as opposed to, to where we think it might be someday. And I wanted to start by just su giving you a 90-second summary, a journalist summary of the field of AI, going back to 1956. Um, and you might not know it, but the field began in 56 with an academic quarrel. And that was because John McCarthy, who coined the term artificial intelligence, picked it because he thought um, he wanted nothing to do with a man by the name of Norbert Wiener, who a number of years before had coined a different term called cybernetics. And, he, and McCarthy thought that Wiener, who was at MIT, McCarthy was not yet there, but he would eventually be a colleague, he thought that Wiener was bombastic and a bore, and he wanted nothing to do with him, and so he came up with a new name, and it stuck. So let's dial the clock one year forward, 1957, and uh, Frank Rosenblatt invented a, a technique called a neural network, which of course is now what is driving much of what we see in today in terms of machines thinking and speaking and reading, what have you. Um, the next year, uh, the Navy held a press conference in Washington, and they said that the perceptron would lead to machines that read and write in one year. Thinking me machines, the, 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 you know, the horizon was one year. So dial the clock a little bit for, farther forward to 1962. McCarthy moves from the East Coast to Stanford. He creates the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. And he proposes, uh, in his first proposal to build the Stanford AI Lab to DARPA, um, that a thinking machine is a 10-year project. Um, this is in 1962. He later sort of modified his view of the world. He came to say that a, a thinking machine would take 1.8 Einsteins and about a tenth of the resources of the Manhattan pro Project. And actually, DARPA ultimately spent that much money. They created a project called Kalo, which actually uh, ended up spending about one-tenth the Manhattan Project, and they got Siri. They didn't actually get a thinking machine. So, so 1966, um, uh, Seymour and Pappert and, and Marvin Minsky, two um, uh, AI researchers at MIT, um, set out to solve the problem of human vision by devoting the work of a graduate student for one summer. They thought that that, that was a much, much work it would take to sort of break the problem of human vision. That was 66. In 1969, a group of Berkeley philosophers became very skeptical about these claims of, of AI, and Hubert Dreyfus wrote a report criticizing Minsky and Papert's work, and he took a look at their assertions, and he said their enthusiasm was a little bit like a man who climbs to the top of a tree and says he's making steady progress on the way to the moon. This was 1969. 1973, the Light Hill Report, um, critical report on the progress of AI in, in the field in England led to what was called the first artificial intelligence winter. They cut spending on, on AI research in England in 73. And ironically, that led to a man by the name of Jeffrey Hinton who couldn't get his research fund in England to come to the United States. And later, Hinton would be the person who was sort of one of the foremost uh, researchers in developing a field called, called deep learning. Mid-1980s in Silicon Valley, there was a second artificial intelligence winter. There were a number of companies that were commercialized, companies like Technology and Syntelligence and IntelliCorp, um, Symantec, they all sort of faltered. Second AI winter. Not a lot happened until 1997, where IBM uh, wrote a program called Deep Blue, and it bested Kasparov, the world's best chess player, and so we all thought that we were making progress again. In 2001, Congress directed um, the Pentagon to, to begin development of a project to make a third of their land vehicle fleet autonomous by 2015. That was last year. Now, ironically, at this point, although very, I don't think there are any uh, autonomous land vehicles in the military, half of the military air fleet 
is now, um, is now drone or autonomous. And uh, apparently there's a lot of autonomous activity underseas, highly classified. We don't know what's going on under the ocean. So in 2004, Tony Tether, who was then director of DARPA, got very worried about the fact that we weren't making progress. And he created these three autonomous vehicle contests between 2004 and 2007. And they led directly first to Google X and the Google car, and then to this, this dramatic uh, explosion of commercial activity that leads us to where we are, are today. Um, 2011, IBM uh, built the Watson program. It defeated the best human jeopardy program, program players. Um, although, one of the things that Watson did really well is it pushed buttons. And there's so, so there may be some argument about how smart of an AI Watson really was. It might have been a better robot. Um, 2012, Google wrote this program um, that, that basically recognized cats on the internet, cat videos. Um, it was considered a great uh, uh, achievement, although if you've looked at uh, YouTube, it's sort of hard not to see cat, vid cat videos, so that might have been less impressive than it sounded. Um, 2013, um, DARPA held the first of the two contests in building robots that could work in extreme environments where humans couldn't go, and this was organized by, by, by Gill, overseen by Gill. And um, 2016, AlphaGo, of course, uh, uh, a program uh, written by programmers at DeepMind, a, a Google sub subsidiary, bested uh, a human Go uh, grandmaster for the first time. And now, so where are we today? If you were in Silicon Valley in the last couple of months and watched uh, Apple and um, Google uh, and saw their developer conferences, we have reached the point where artificial intelligence is now again in the valley. It's like the equivalent of a whitening agent in a laundry detergent. Now with AI. AI has become a marketing term in, in, uh, in Silicon Valley. So that's the view from the point of view of a journalist. Yep. How, where are we in the field from the point of view of someone who actually builds these things? So um, my view is uh, somewhat humble. And uh, it's wonderful to hear that, that history recapped. Uh, in my particular case, I worked at MIT as a PhD student for a professor, a guy named uh, Jerry Lettvin, who uh, was a neurophysiologist and himself was hired by Norbert Wiener. So there's a lot of links that are going on here. Um, and I know this battle between the two sides very, very well. It's important to understand uh, a fallacy of thought that has gone on. Uh, computers can play games. Computers can beat people playing those games. Does that mean that computers think better than people? Is thinking only about games? Thinking is about many, many things. Thinking is about writing poetry, about writing music, about understanding deep philosophical arguments, uh, all sorts of things. And so it's important to understand it may actually be that games are something that people are not very good at. Why? Because you know, our brains didn't evolve to play Go. You know, we evolved to find food, to find mates, to survive, etc. I don't know of an evolutionary force until at least recently uh, <laughs> for playing Go. Maybe Go players you know, get to date each other and so that's sort of a good thing. Um, but uh, it's important not to be fooled and not to be tricked. The big uh, spike that has happened in capability in AI is uh, something called deep learning. The particular technique that's been used that's been the most successful that Jeff Hinton and Jan LeCun and others have worked on is called convolutional neural networks, uh, a type of neural network like those that were developed first in the 1950s. And what it really is, is simply a table that maps input to output. If we have these inputs, it'll generate those outputs. And in the middle is this neural network, which itself is a very crude abstraction of what goes on in the human brain or any animal brain. And uh, what has happened is, even though the algorithms for doing this kind of learning have existed for decades and people have hypothesized that this might work, what really changed recently in the last five years has been the cell phone. Okay, now, what does the cell phone have to do with neural networks? There are no neural networks, at least in current software and cell phones. But cell phones allow all of us to take lots of pictures. And those pictures all go uh, uploaded up to the cloud, to the internet. And we put them on Facebook or any other ones of these uh, services. And as a result, millions of pictures every day end up in the cloud. Uh, scientists took those pictures 
and a particular scientist named Fei Fei Li at Stanford, a professor, head of the Stanford AI lab, and she created a database called ImageNet with millions of pictures inside of it, and she enlisted a whole bunch of people through crowdsourcing to label those images. This is a horse, this is a cow, this is a person, this is a cat, there were lots of cats, because people take pictures of cats. And we ended up with this training set of input to output. Lots of images and lots of what we call ground truth. Picture of a cat, the word cat. Picture of a cow, the word cow. And then, as a result of her work, other scientists went and applied these decades old algorithms to try to learn off of the millions of images what that mapping was, what that table was between pictures and labels. And the miracle that happened was it turned out that it worked. And it worked extraordinarily well. And what's been happening for the last four to five years has been tremendous progress on that idea of mapping input to output. And it turns out it can work just about as well as human beings can do the same task. So you give a person a picture and you say, what's in the picture? And they say, that's a cat. Uh, you give another one, that's a cow, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it turns out machines now are just about as good as human beings are at that task. And it turns out that they don't get tired, so they can do it for a long time. And if you have lots of machines, they can do it faster than a person can. And so this object classification task, from images to labels, has been one of the great successes of AI. It turns out there are other tasks that are like that. Uh, hearing speech and turning it into text, words, is the same kind of input to output task. And so through deep learning, through convolutional neural networks, we've succeeded at that knowing what the next move should be in AlphaGo. It has a few twists on it, but largely the same idea, mapping the board positions to what the next move should be. Uh, so the real question, the deep question, is, is that all that thinking is? When we think, is it just pattern matching, input to output, or is there something more to it? And the answer is that none of us know. None of us know. But it's important to know that what's been accomplished so far is a tiny, tiny fraction of what human beings are capable of. You once framed this to me as saying we've made great progress, steady progress, now we're actually accelerated progress in pattern recognition, not so much in cognition. Yes. Is, is that a? Yes, that is absolutely correct. So the way to think about this, and you know, uh, I studied a lot of neurophysiology, but I remember just a little bit. But here's one of the things that I remember. The back of the brain is where perception happens. It's kind of strange. Our eyes are in front, but the neurons go to the back of the brain. So the vision centers are back here. Part of vision is object classification. And right now, computers do that as good or maybe even a little better than people because they don't get tired. The front of the brain is where cognition happens, where we think. And uh, this has been known for a very long time. And you look at um, lots of animals have very well-developed backs of the brains, but the front is really well-developed in human beings. Um, here's why it might be that cognition could also be a target for AI that was successful. The structure, the architecture of the brain is similar in the back and in the front. The cortex, the anatomy, the wiring is actually quite similar on both sides. So it may be, and we don't know, that the artificial intelligence methods, these machine learning methods that are used on the back could also be used to emulate what goes on in the front. But here's the big difference. We have an enormous data set of images to labels due to people taking pictures on their cell phone that has enabled us to figure out perception, at least to the object labeling case, we have almost no data on cognition. What are the fundamental kind of atomic units of thinking? How do we build a database of millions of examples of people thinking? We have no cell phone to take pictures of our thoughts. And so that's been the holdup. So given that dichotomy, um, there's a community of very smart people in Silicon Valley, um, some of them are computer scientists, some of them are other things, physicists, what have you, who believe we're on this accelerating path. Mm -hmm. um, Nick Bostrom, um, who's I think kind of a philosopher, wrote a book called yeah. Superintelligence, yeah. Elon Musk and people like Bill Gates. Uh, how are they off base, first of all? Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, what is the pace? Uh, and uh, can, can we get to that next step in brute force if we can't get there without actually understanding right. cognition? Well, so my, my feeling is that the issues that they bring up are legitimate, uh, but that it's the wrong time. So right now, we're really just at the beginning of this study. Um, 
Andrew Ng, who's a professor at Stanford and also a chief scientist at Baidu, uh, I think said it best. And what he said is that I worry about AI becoming evil uh, the same way that I worry about overpopulation on Mars. <laughs> and he goes on to say, well, you know, someday when humans colonize Mars, overpopulation on Mars may actually become an issue, but he can't get too worked up about it right now because we're doing a whole lot of other things and no one's setting up human colonies on Mars yet. Uh, I think it's very much the same kind of thing, and I, I think that Andrew is right. Uh, there are many legitimate concerns about the misapplication of AI uh, and over-trusting AI uh, in certain applications. But this isn't anything new. It's a, it's a quality control problem. We have to make sure that the quality reliability of AI is uh, good enough to entrust various safe parts, uh, parts of human life that need to be kept safe. So, you know, we're in the midst of this kind of national, maybe even international anxiety mm -hmm. about the pace of this acceleration. The White House is in the midst of having a series yeah. of symposia on, on artificial intelligence as a potential existential threat to humanity. Do you think they picked the wrong technology? There are certainly other technologies mm -hmm. uh, around. CRISPR, uh, a, gen, a, gene, a gene editing technique, comes to mind. Right. Um, so I, I, I don't know too much about biology, so I won't comment on that, but I think that there are a large number of threats. When, when you work at DARPA, I worked there for five and a half years, uh, you do a lot of work uh, together with different parts of the Department of Defense, and you learn a whole lot of things. And uh, you realize that there are many, many threats, actually, to the human race. Uh, and I personally think that there are other places where we should be um, anxious first. Yeah, okay. Well, well let, let's, let's, I wanted to sort of back into self-driving cars. Um, sure. Last week in Science Magazine, uh, the lead story was about something called the trolley problem. Mm -hmm. And this was a reframing of the trolley problem. Uh, let me try to simplify the trolley problem. A philosopher, Philippe Foote, British philosopher in the 60s, came up with this way of thinking about ethical decisions. And her model of the trolley problem is you're on this track in a runaway trolley and you're about to over, run over five workers. And you have the option of throwing a switch, but you notice on the track that there are two there and you'll run them over. And it's been restated a million different ways. What was interesting about the Science Magazine article is they actually went out and polled people about what they thought. And it, 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 the, the result was as you might expect. It turns out that most people want um, want other people to buy utilitarian cars that will make utilitarian decisions, uh, cars that will make decisions when they come to these difficult problems that are uh, for the greatest good, except for themselves. They want to buy a car that will protect themselves first. And uh, this, of course, leads to the tragedy of the commons, potentially. But I wanted to ask you, uh, this is to the you know, uh, ethical decisions of machines. Um, is this the right way to think about designing machines that have to make these decisions? So, uh, so is the, it possible? Yeah. Right, right. Uh, I think that the trolley problem is interesting to think about, but uh, it turns out it's a subset of a greater number of problems that really matter the most. Uh, if you are in an autonomous car, you can use it in a variety of different ways. Uh, the lower levels of autonomy are one where it's basically doing something that's convenient, similar to cruise control, but it still relies on you uh, to be vigilant, to watch for other traffic, to make sure that it doesn't make a mistake, and that you supervise the autonomy that's in the car. Uh, at higher levels of autonomy, the trust goes up, and the human being trusts the car more and more, and eventually, when you're at the peak of that, you can go to sleep, and the car will drive for you, and you will arrive at your destination, well-rested, uh, etc. cetera. The, the real question is, you know, when does the machine reach that level of trust? And how do we know when it's that good? And the answer, not only for the trolley problem, which is a particularly uh, sort of a philosophical way of making the problem as hard as possible. The machine needs to choose between two terrible outcomes. Take a life on the left side, take a life on the right side. How's it going to judge which, which life is worth more? And it turns out uh, human beings are terrible at that, too, even if they say, uh, I value young people over old people, or I value old people over young people, whatever they say, when faced in a simulator with exactly the same thing, and they have to quickly make a decision, they'll often choose the wrong one. Because again, you know, it's very hard for us to do. It's gonna be hard for the computer to do too, because it's hard for the computer to be certain about its perceptions. But this uncertainty about perceptions exists much more broadly than in just the um, 
just the trolley problem. It exists in everyday driving, okay? We are incredibly good at driving. And when people tell you uh, autonomous cars are already better than human beings at driving, don't believe them, okay? It's not true. And just to back this up with some numbers here, uh, the fatality rate in the United States, turns out since I work for Toyota, it's the same I know in Japan, uh, is one fatality per 100 million miles, okay? 100 million miles. And that is even including drunk driving, uh, people falling asleep at the wheel because of fatigue, people texting while driving, which I know no one here does, right? Uh, and so it's not unreasonable to think that if we behaved better, that that number would be a factor of 10 higher. And so instead of one fatality every 100 million miles, it would be one fatality every trillion miles. Sorry, every billion miles. I gotta get that right. Uh, the company that's been working uh, sort of the longest in the autonomous driving field is Google. That came directly out of the DARPA challenges you spoke about before. They have amassed around two million miles of uh, testing. And it turns out that that's great. But again, remember how good human beings are. One fatality every, if we act well, billion miles. There's a big difference between a million and a billion, a factor of a thousand. And so the autonomous driving field is really in its infancy. We're still nowhere nearly as good as people are in the best case. Yeah. And, and, and so the trolley problem is interesting but it's actually the wrong problem to be worried about right now. Let, let's worry about driving in traffic. And so let's work to, let's work to that. Um, okay. I, I don't want to sort of pin you down on your competitors, sure. but it's coming fast and furious. Mm -hmm. um, BMW and Intel and Mobileye are going to make an announcement tomorrow, which I guess BMW has already made the announcement. They said that they will introduce a self-driving car at level five, which mm -hmm. is in 2021. Well, five years right. is a long time away. Elon Musk has been a little more, bit more aggressive as he is in many of these things. I think he said two years for the technology and um, one year uh, for the regulatory, uh, which is, seems to be optimistic on yeah. both, both fronts. Um, I, you know, largely because I've watched your contest, yeah. I've become more skeptical. And t tell me if you'd take this bet. I've been going around the country saying that if the Uber robot comes to my home in San Francisco in 2025, yeah and uh, takes me to dinner in Palo Alto, mm. I'm buying. Do you think I'm gonna lose my bet? Uh, it depends what time of day it is and what day of the year <laughs> so, it is. Yeah. So, so, so here's, the, here's the reality. Uh, if we allocated special lanes on the highway for autonomous cars, and uh, there was a very stiff penalty for any human being ever driving into that lane, think of HOV lane, but really only for autonomous cars, we could have autonomous cars at level five driving in those lanes now, okay? The cars would all talk to each other. They would all know where each other are. These essentially would be the same as if you were, uh, you know, if you remember slot cars, little model cars that raced on slots. It would work like, like that. The cars would know exactly where they're going. They would not uh, collide with each other. It would be perfectly safe. Is that more than Super Cruise, which is in the market from some manufacturers already? So Super Cruise is that, but it also allows you to interact with human-driven cars as well and uh, to avoid accidents with them. So the, the trouble, you know, I'm sorry to paraphrase here, but it depends what the definition of autonomous <laughs> is, okay? <laughs> And yeah. the definition of autonomous at its maximum is this challenge that you've put forward of, you know, this car's going to take me to, to dinner. Uh, but that, again, depends on the traffic. So if the traffic is good, the weather is good, the, uh, by, by good I, I mean the traffic is light. Perhaps it's Sunday night, okay? Uh, the weather is good. Uh, the maps that have been accumulated about the particular roads to drive from you to somewhere else are very accurate, and there's been no construction on those zones, and you know that for a fact, I think you may lose the bet, yeah. okay? But if it's uh, Friday night, which I think is a pretty <laughs> tough time for traffic, if San Francisco's fogged in, uh, and, you know, uh, and they're doing construction, uh, then, you'll lose, then you'll win the bet, because, um, in fact, that's very, very hard to do. Yeah. So that's the difference. There's no single line. Let's talk about your research group. You, you came to Silicon Valley. Um, uh, Toyota is investing a billion dollars in a research laboratory, which in some ways, to my mind, is evocative of what um, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center uh, was uh, 30 years ago, um, an effort to try to sort of 
rejigger an entire industry. But you came with a different sort of much of the much of many there are many uh, uh, auto, automotive industry autonomous vehicle labs in the valley right. now, uh, all sort of bent on uh, on self driving. My sense is that you came with a different yeah. mission, and yes. this is this yeah. is talk, talk about what you're doing that's sure. different than the rest of the so vehicle. so for me the the mission is very personal and it actually relates to my father. Uh, who passed away a few years ago, but in a few years before he passed away, uh, went through a significant uh, difficulty with dementia. And uh, I think that we've all had uh, uh, parents and relatives that have gone through this, uh, and it's absolutely awful. And uh, what I felt at the end of this thing, having been sort of this technical person up till then, is you know surely we can do better. And one of the awful things that occurred was the day where my sister and I had to take away his car keys. And you know that's a terrible thing to do to a person. Uh, and this was the guy who had taught me how to drive and who prided himself his whole life on being the one who would kind of get things done in the house uh, and um, who loved to drive. And he felt the car was an extension of his body. And when he drove the car at night, that the headlights were like you know knives sort of seeing in the, the distance. And he just loved what it was like to drive a car. And so the first thing that popped into my head that was in great synchrony with Toyota was it turns out that the, um, the president of Toyota, Mr. Akio Toyoda, uh, loves to drive as well and is a race car driver and thinks that Toyota should be fun to drive and that that thrill should exist. Uh, but society is aging. In the United States, we're going from 13% over age 65 right now to 20% over age 65 in the next 15 years. And this is all the result of the baby boom coming through the population. Uh, the situation in Japan, much worse. It's 20% right now. They actually recently surpassed that uh, they sell more adult diapers than baby diapers. Okay, that's what's going on in Japan. Uh, and guess what? In 20 years, because their birth rate is so low, uh, they will hit 40% over age 65. So imagine a society where 40% of the population is over age 65. Uh, how do you actually improve quality of life in a society like that? How do you make what happened with my dad not happen? And the first part, of course, is to develop cars that can be driven for longer, even if, you are, uh, if your reflexes are not as good and uh, you have more difficulty driving the car. And so that was one part. The second part is in the future, and even a little bit now, when you look at a car, what you're really going to see, and this is Rod Brooks who said this, I think very well, uh, is an elder care robot. That's what cars of the future are going to be. And uh, there are some cars right now that are a little bit close to that. Well, if you're going to build cars that are elder care robots, can you build other elder care robots that would work inside the home? And uh, we think the answer is yes. And since I've worked in robotics for so long, uh, that's sort of the second part to this. And of course, with my dad, it was not only uh, having to take away his car keys, which was very difficult. And by the way, my wife, who's in the, in the audience, had to do the same thing with her father as well. And it was just as awful. Uh, but the next stage, uh, how do you maintain your dignity? Can you age in place at home? This is going to become a tremendous issue in the next 15 years in the U.S. And can we build technology to support aging in place uh, rather than the indignity of having to move uh, first to assisted living and then to a nursing home, whatever? And so maybe my question should be, rather than the question of when the, when's the car going to arrive, could, could you take a guess at when might there be a robot that could safely give an aging human a shower. Right. Is that even, I mean. So I think it's going to happen, uh, and it will happen within the next 15 years for sure. Not because uh, I am good at prediction and technology, but because the technology is there now, it turns out the cost is just too high, and it takes tremendous investment in order to guarantee the safety of this thing to the level that it needs to be at in order to make sure that the person is not hurt. That problem is actually not that hard. Uh, but can we make it economical for either the healthcare system or people themselves uh, to buy the machines to do this thing? But, but, but you're, I mean, one of the, the audience doesn't know this, but Gil is one of the people who pioneered this field in robotics known as compliance, making machines that actually are safe to work around right. humans. When I watched the outtakes from the, the robotic <laughs> rescue challenge, he, he basically also commissioned these 400 pound uh, machines that were made out of heavy metal, and they would fall over. 
grandma should not be anywhere near yeah. any of those machines. And I, I began, <laughs> no, I mean, I mean it's a, it's That's a, absolutely a true. serious question of how yeah. do you, how far are we from machines like that that can actually lift humans or right. be close right. to them? So um, again, I, I'm fairly certain that within the next 15 years we're gonna have them. And the reason is necessity. We, we have no choice. It's, it's too hard to take care of a elderly person in a physical way doing that. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, here have seen a thing called a uh, Hoyer lift, which is a medical device that picks people up and they use them to transfer a person uh, from a bed to the shower and back and so forth. What's missing is the control of that and a machine to kind of put it around the uh, patient and to bring it back and forth. So the technology for that is actually not too hard. It's just an economics question. Okay. Um, so the, uh, there's been much more research on this in Japan and Europe than in the yeah. United States. Um, I, I recently went to a trade show here in the United States called um, Aging 2.0. And I was struck at how, I mean, what was striking is how little was there. The most, the most interesting thing was sort of a redone iPad that could perhaps let a person who was not uh, dexterous and, uh, communicate with their loved ones. But in terms of, you know, things that interacted with humans, uh, perhaps robots, there was so little. Right. Um, is, what, what, what I think is important to understand is it's all about money, okay? Uh, taking care of the elderly is not a hot business in Silicon Valley right now. And the reason is that's not where the money is. The money is in cell phones for young people and uh, things that key off of that. Yeah. And what will change within 10 to 15 years is society's tremendous need in this regard because of aging society. Uh, you know, whatever our social norms might be in terms of how much you know, we follow the Ten Commandments to respect your mother and father, which is, of course, what this is all based on. Uh, both in the U.S. and particularly in Japan, uh, in the coming Asia. years, it'll happen in China as well, South Korea. Uh, this problem will become so severe that it will have to be solved. And so the confidence that I have is actually based on the need being there. Yeah, I think you actually even understated the demographic challenge. I mean, that's what's relevant. I think the number of people over 80 globally will double by right. the middle of the century. Yep. It will go up by sevenfold by the end of the century. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's amazing. I came to this sort of religion. Um, I was one of those people with my hair on fire about the impact of um, technology on jobs. Yeah. And then I, you know, I talked to Danny Kahneman, who's this behavioral economist, and I was sort of arguing that robots were going to come to China and they were going to lead to social disruption. He said, you don't get it. He said, in China, they'll be lucky if the robots come just in time. Right. And I didn't get what he said until I looked at the demographics. And so it's this dual thing that you're pointing out. One is the working age workforce is shrinking. I think it shrank by five million last year in China. And at the same time, you know, the Chinese have this wonderful tradition of caring for the elderly, but the population is aging so quickly that they're not going to be e able to easily do that. Yes. So, I mean, that's this is, right. Silicon Valley perhaps isn't seeing the market that's staring them in the face. I think that's true. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And, and, it's, and some of it is um, how far one sees, right? So it takes um, being able to see out 15 years, which is not a Silicon Valley thing. <laughs> Sorry. I know many of you are from there. Uh, we just moved there, so uh, <laughs> now you know, we is us. So, <laughs> so yesterday, um, Satya Nadella, interviewed by Walter Isaacson, called for um, and both empathic and ethical yeah. robots. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I mean, is that possible? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, we're, the thing that's happened recently in Silicon Valley, also the sort of the the, the hot product or the hot service of the moment are conversational agents, mm -hmm. machines that talk to you. Mm -hmm. And um, can we trust things that are designed by companies like Google and Facebook <laughs> that may have ulterior motives? Uh, I think that we can. I don't want to um, endorse any particular company over any other one. Uh, we at Toyota are looking at this too, and we think that the idea of an empathic machine, a machine that basically you can trust to act in a certain way and that understands you well enough to, um, to know your intent is very important. Uh, many people feel that way about their cars. Okay? I don't know how many of you, but uh, you know, many people love their cars. And um, our president, again, makes the comparison between a car and a refrigerator. And I know, you know the sub-zero is very, very nice. Right? But most people don't you know, embrace the refrigerator and say, oh, I love you. you know? uh, but they do feel that way about their car in many cases. And so there's this bond that occurs because the car in real time amplifies our abilities to do all kinds of things. And I think that this is beginning to happen 
with certain apps uh, where we become completely dependent as sort of a intellectual prosthetic or an intellectual orthotic, I don't know how you want to see it, but an amplifier of our own thinking because we look things up on Google all of the time. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I, I do think that's going to happen. Interesting. And um, just, just sort of slightly going in a slightly different direction, because one of the, your first hires was a, a researcher whose name was James Kuffner. And Correct. He is a um, pioneer in an area called cloud robotics. Correct. And the cloud robotics, I mean, is interesting because I guess robots don't learn the way that we do. If you teach one robot some, something, they all they all know it instantly, which is not true in human society. Well, so 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 here's an amazing thing. So um, again, I don't know how many of you watched Star Trek uh, or watched Star Star Trek and saw the Borg. You know, who lived in this big cube and. Resistance uh, is futile. Resistance is futile, yes. <laughs> uh, well, so that was a very negative uh, view of the same idea. But when we human beings talk to each other, um, we actually communicate at an incredibly low rate of information. Okay? It's called the Shannon entropy, after Claude Shannon, the pioneer of communications theory. And our communications rate in Shannon entropy is around 10 bits per second. Okay? That's bits per second. Now, when you sign up for internet at your house, you get tens of megabits per second. And when you connect two computers to each other with a wired uh, ethernet cable, it's a gigabit per second. Uh, and then you can go even faster than that. So there's this remarkable difference between robots communicating on the internet and people when they try to communicate with each other. We're stuck down at 10 bits per second. And that's not gonna change for a long time. These robots can actually communicate thousands and thousands of times faster. And what it means is that it's incredibly effective to spread what one machine learns to all of the other ones almost instantaneously. And actually, James Kuffner was the pioneer and coined the term uh, cloud robotics. So the work that we're doing, and this is true in cars as well, is that uh, when cars en encounter circumstances, they'll share it with um, all of the other ones. Which is already true. I, I think the mobile eye technology is, <coughs> yep. is out there in... Um in uh, Chevy's and Volkswagen's at the end of this year, they'll all be sort of. Yes. And I mean, you can talk about that hypothetically, but will it? I mean, how how um, how much impact will that have on on autonomous driving in terms of yeah. making it so safer? And what what I think will happen is it will accelerate the development of capability, and it will do that in the robotics field as well. So many of you uh, know very well Moore's law, right? Which means every so much time. Uh, the rate of progress, the, the progress you're at, goes up by a certain factor. So, for instance, every two years, the number of transistors on a chip will double. And that has been true for a long time, although we're approaching some physical uh, limits that may uh, make that plateau in the future. But in general, in many technologies outside of integrated circuits, they follow kind of a Moore's law. There's even reason to believe that uh, our DNA has evolved over time uh, according to an ex exponential curve in terms of how we got to where, where we are. Um, every once in a while, there are these disruptive events where progress is hyper-exponential. One of those in evolutionary history, 450 million years ago, was the Cambrian explosion, where suddenly we had many, many different creatures uh, evolve out of some relatively simple ones. People have wondered why did that happen at that time. And there are many theories. And there's no particular certainty as to which one's true. But one of the ones that um, I find appealing is uh, that it was because of the evolution of vision. That before that, we had very simple light receptors that could tell generally light versus dark in a blurred way. But then after that, we had the pupil and then the lens. And suddenly, animals could see prey at a distance, could see potential mates at a distance, could see food at a distance. And so the rate of evolution suddenly spiked and became much, much faster and we ended up with this great diversity. Uh, I personally think that a lot of the sort of Moore's Law uh, exponential um, developments in electronics and many other technologies have reached a kind of critical point like the development of vision, and deep learning is one of those things, that means that robotics and autonomous cars may soon have a similar sort of snap of hyper-exponential increase of capabilities. So I don't know when it's gonna happen, but uh, it looks like we're sort of brewing that up. 
Let me jump back to the Borg for a second because um, <laughs> you were at DARPA and it's probably not fair to, I know you were this part of DARPA, but um, the Obama Brain Initiative, mm. um, the goal was not only to read from a million neurons simultaneously, but yeah. it was to write to a million neurons. Yes. And I know that's only a half step away from science fiction, but it does sort of hint at the possibility of bandwidth, communications bandwidth right. to the human mind that's right. beyond the... So um, it, we, it, we actually studied this a great deal. So I, I worked in the Defense Sciences Office, and uh, Colonel Jeff Ling, who actually was a very uh, big part of the, uh, of the brain initiative uh, that the White House uh, started up, was actually um, part of that office too. And um, the program that you're talking about was called Repair. And the idea was that if you had a traumatic brain injury or other injury in the nervous system, could you build a jumper cable from one part of the brain to the other, or if it's a spinal cord injury from one part of the nervous system to the other and jump over that. You have to be able to read, you have to be able to write. And of course, you know, many people that heard about this in the, in the press got very worried because, oh, they're gonna try to put thoughts into our brains. But I think as long as you don't allow the probes in, uh, you don't need to worry. So. Um, but uh, this, uh, this kind of idea, we don't know if it's actually possible to get higher bandwidth. Uh, and it's a remarkable thing. Even our vision, which is the highest bandwidth input that comes into our brain, uh, certainly the number of pixels that come in and the equivalent frame rate that we can see motion and changes is very, very high. But very quickly in this perceptual part of our brain in the back, we refine that into some very kind of slow and simple conclusions as to what it is that we're seeing. And it's not clear that we don't reduce that tremendous pipe down to a very low bandwidth, uh, and then we deal with those. Um, when I, if I were to ask you, you know, how rapidly uh, do you perceive certain things? Uh, the answer is you know, a couple objects per second at most. Yeah. So it's not that we're you know, flipping through a book like this uh, and then we've read the whole thing. That, that doesn't happen. And so 10 bits per second may be some kind of fundamental limit. We don't actually know. Okay. In, in 2005, Andy Rubin, who later started uh, Google's robotics effort, said yeah. to me um, that um, personal computers were starting to grow legs and move around in the environment. And at first, I didn't get what he meant. But then I, you know, I, I watched your contest. And it was pretty clear that they are starting to move around. They're, they're, they're still just starting to move right. around. And um, there is a company in the Boston area called Boston Dynamics that you, you contracted with to build the robots for the autonomous vehicle. And there are these remarkable creatures um, that were largely teleoperated. Um, mm -hmm. That was, I, mean, I don't know if people have seen the Boston Dynamic videos that come out at routine intervals, but they're well worth looking at because it gives you the sense that the machines are not just beginning to move around the world, but they're moving around facilely in an unstructured environment, not like cars where they drive in you know, fairly open spaces. But um, you know, could you give people sort of an instruction manual for watching the Boston Dynamics videos? And sure. what, what, are, what, what are we missing when we see those dogs yeah, yeah. bounding around? So it's, um, it's really remarkable to see these things. Uh, these are legged robots. They work incredibly well. They do all kinds of tricks. Um, but it's important to remember that they're doing really the lowest level of AI that one can do, which is motor control. Uh, if you have an actual biological dog, uh, its brain is a tiny fraction of the size of your brain, and yet it gets around just fine, and it can do the same kind of tricks that uh, the Boston Dynamics robots can do. In fact, it's even better because it has eyes, it can perceive, it can think, it can uh, figure out where it wants to go. What you're seeing, and what John mentioned, is that these machines are teleoperated for the most part. So people have a joystick and they say, go that way. And what the machine handles is the rough terrain on its own. It decides the gait, it decides exactly where to place its feet, and does it quite, quite well. But it's really, it's the spinal cord, and it's a little bit of the motor part of the brain, and it's a little bit of proprioception. But for, the, for the, a large part, the machines are blind. And it's only recently, actually, that Boston Dynamics and other companies in this field have begun to marry the improvements that have happened in machine perception to this incredible work that they've done uh, at the spinal cord level and in the motor and um, proprioception level. Uh, and I think the neat future is going to be to put those two things together. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I also wanted to go back to uh, your sort of 
your, your new employer, Toyota, and mm -hmm. their assertion that there is this special relationship between humans and their cars. Mm -hmm. Because you know, the, the popular perception in Silicon Valley is that in the future, transportation will be a service. Mm -hmm. And because you will simply push a button and a car will arrive, we will need fewer cars. And now I know that awaits, that fact awaits on the actual uh, you know, arrival of autonomous vehicles, right. but there, there is this notion that it might be a real threat to the traditional automotive industry. Yeah, uh, so mobility as a service, MAAS, which is sort of the term in the car industry we use for this, uh, is without a doubt increasing. So Uber with human drivers right now uh, is a very good test of this, and uh, other, um, other companies like Lyft, and there's several others. Uh, and certain fractions of the population love those services and they use them some of the time. And uh, I'll uh, you know, kind of make a confession here. We have a, a son, one of four, who is uh, 19 years old today and uh, who does not have a driver's license. Inconceivable to his father, <laughs> okay? When I was uh, you know, the youngest possible age to get my learner's permit, I was right there because I wanted to drive. But it is a different world, and young people today care more about um, Facebook than they care about their, their cars, but it's not 100%. It's a, it's a subtle shift, and there's even reason to believe, I've heard, that it's coming back, and that there's a little bit of more love of car going on, too. And so uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. We don't know. Certainly, there's a growing um, part of the transportation field, the mobility field, which will be mobility as a service. Taxi cabs have been around forever. Uh, as they become more autonomous, if we can actually trust them, uh, I believe that will actually go up because uh, it's sort of, it feels better to get in a vehicle that doesn't have a person because you're not imposing on them to drive you. You don't have to worry, are they a good driver? Are they a bad driver? You sort of know what you're getting each time you get into the uh, vehicle. Um, but we, the real answer is that we don't know. And we think that uh, love of car is going to actually keep going for quite some time uh, for some people for some of the time. Uh, and we also think that love of robot, uh, and I don't want to get too far into some of the other sessions that they're having here uh, on sex and love and all those sorts of things. That's not what I'm talking about, just to be clear. Uh, but uh, you know, love is, is a wonderful, deep thing. And what we saw at the DARPA Robotics Challenge, and you were there, was this remarkable thing, uh, which makes me think that actually people will be enamored of the technology that helps them in the home um, much, much more than we would guess. Uh, the first piece of evidence from that was that when the robots fell down, and many, many of them fell down, uh, the audience, which was you know, uh, 10,000 people, just gasped, like, oh, you know. And in fact, a reporter, and I don't remember whether you were at this session, but after the first day at the, at the finals, there was a reporter who, you know, she raised her hand and she was you know, shaking and almost ready to cry. It's like, is, is the MIT robot, which had fallen down and broken an arm, <laughs> Uh, is it going to be okay? <laughs> and, 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 you know, I've been working in this field a long time, so I really didn't get it. Uh, but then I thought a little bit, and it's like, okay, it's a machine <laughs> we can replace, you know. Uh, and in fact, it was okay because we replaced the arm and it was fine. Uh, but that's, that's the kind of empathy that happens, and this has been uh, known for a long, long time. Uh, and, um, and, you know, people project... Uh, this anthropomorphic view. We, we project feelings onto inanimate things. Many people think that their car is sentient, right? And back in the old days when the carburetor would, didn't work so well and stuff like that, the, people thought their car had moods, right? Oh, well, you know, she's not feeling so good today or he's not feeling so good today. I won't be sexist. Uh, but uh, these days, cars are much more reliable, so that has kind of dropped out. But we still have this thing where we project our emotions onto other things. Um, and uh, this is sometimes called the ELISA effect, after a very short computer program which does a type of psycho, um, uh, psychoanalysis by talking back and forth to a person in a way that is incredibly dumb. It mostly just echoes what the person says to it. And many people are fooled and think there's a person at the other side. And in fact, there's one page of software speaking back to them. Uh, so. I'm gonna open it up to the audience, but I have one last area I'd like you to comment on before we, we go broad, more broadly. Um, about every decade or so, we as a nation go through this period of anxiety about automation and jobs. Mm. And uh, you know, we're back there again, which is pretty striking because at the moment there are more than 150 million people working in America, which mm. is more than ever in history. But it's a nuanced 
situation, right. and right. what do you foresee? So um, I've uh, been a part of this uh, group that met at MIT uh, very yeah. often over the last uh, year and a half with um, John McAfee and Eric uh, Brynjolfsson, and, uh, and we talked about this a lot, and uh, it's a matter for their uh, books also. Uh, I think actually there's something serious to consider here. Uh, without a doubt, adding automation, adding robotics to society will increase our societal wealth. It'll increase it tremendously. And you know, you can sort of re reduce it to the problem of uh, Robinson Crusoe, and he's sitting there on the island, and let's say he has a choice. Do you want to do all your chores by yourself, or would you like the robot next to you to work with you to do all of your chores? What do you think he's going to choose? There's no money. He's by himself. Of course, having the robot's a good thing, right? So the way to think about this is it's not about whether having robots is a good idea. Having robots is a tremendously good idea because it means that we don't have to work so hard and our quality of life can go up. As a society, we are going to become incredibly wealthy as a result of this technology. The real problem is the distribution of wealth. Okay? And I know that if you were all Republicans, that would be a dirty thing to say, and so I'm glad that that's not true. Uh, but it's actually about the distribution of wealth. And so how can we fit, you know, traditionally wealth has been distributed as a result of labor and capital. Well, capital seems to still work no matter how we set this thing up. But the distribution of wealth by labor is the part that's under threat by having more automation in society. If we don't have to work very much, if the value of our work gets lower and lower and lower, what mechanism will be used to figure out who gets what? And that's actually the problem to be solved. But it's important not to confuse it with sort of a very simplistic view of they're going to take our jobs and that's bad. Okay? The answer is they're going to help us tremendously and that's good. And we also have to figure out this distribution of wealth thing. And there are many answers to that too. Okay. Let's add the, the audience. Since there are microphone people. So if you'll raise your hand, I'll point, uh, point to you. In the blue jacket first, there's a microphone behind you. Uh, hi, my name is Arturo. Um, could you talk a little bit about what I call assisted intelligence? I can't live without my phone anymore, so that's part of my intelligence today. Yes, uh, so that's, that's really great. Uh, there was this uh, wonderful person named Jay Licklider, who was a professor at MIT. He actually was a DARPA uh, office director for a short time as well and founded the information technology office at uh, DARPA. And he wrote a seminal paper uh, which was called Man-Machine Symbiosis. And this was written back in the 1960s. Uh, and what he basically said is that it's not artificial intelligence, it's intelligence amplification. That's actually what we should be doing. Let's figure out a way for machines and people uh, to work synergistically and symbiotically together uh, to do better. Machines are good at certain things that people are bad at and vice versa. Uh, and we think that that's really true. So in autonomous driving, to give an example, there's one way of doing it which we call the chauffeur mode. And this is traditionally what most people think about for autonomous driving. I tell the autonomy, drive me home. And it goes ahead and it drives me home. That's like telling a chauffeur to drive you home. Uh, in another mode, which we've been working on a great deal, we actually call it the guardian angel mode. And this is an internal sort of name that we at, uh, at the Toyota Research Institute use for this. And uh, it's a mode where the autonomy, the AI, is in parallel with you and works synergistically. And so the car becomes safer, but you still drive it. And it turns out that that's much easier. And many of you have sort of uh, had the experience with um, with anti-lock brakes, stability control, more recently uh, automatic emergency braking, where if a car is about to hit some, something in the front, it'll stop. We imagine that in the future, these systems will get much, much better, and the car will be able to temporarily take control from you if it thinks something really terrible is about to happen, and then switch it back to you. We're beginning to see this now, but that's very much more of the synergistic, symbiotic role between uh, the intelligence on the outside and the uh, person. So I think that's a good duel uh, between AI and IA, between chauffeur mode and guardian angel mode. Other questions? There's a question there. My name is Dean Ambrose. I hope I'm speaking into it. And 
Dean Ambrose, and I live in Los Angeles and have a home in, in Palm Springs. I just acquired a Model X. And I can tell you that that Model X with its, with its robotics is able to drive me on the freeway from Los Angeles to Palm Springs yeah. with staying completely off of the brake and the accelerator. Yeah. And it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. So we, we are pretty much there, are we not? In that limited environment. And so as long as the weather's good and the sensor's not fooled, as long as you're agreeing to, if you read the manual for the car, it says, I don't know if it actually says this is level two, but it says you must remain vigilant while this is in operation. And they really do mean it, because if suddenly there is bad weather or a truck in front is, uh, has a box that falls off, it's still counting on you, the human being, to take over. Uh, so we're, we're at that stage, but we still have a way to go where you can uh, read a book or fall asleep. Or, uh, and then, of course, we still have to move from the freeway where things are not so complicated into the city where it's much harder. And then from the city in the US to uh, a city in some other part of the world where it can be much, much worse. So we're beginning to get there. I think that's the right answer. Any questions? How about way in the back in the red? And, and I know you mentioned about hyper evolution disrupts. I was wondering, do you think that quantum computing is one of those? So uh, the question was, uh, to what extent quantum computing might actually accelerate this even further? Uh, so I'm not an expert on quantum computing by any means, and I don't know uh, the progress, and there's a tremendous amount of hype as well as some very real progress that's happening as well. Uh, it has the potential to revolutionize things. So that is definitely true. How close we are to that, that I'm not sure of. A question here in the back. Hi, my name is Belize. I work in the energy industry. Um, the image of uh, having a robot care for your elderly mother or father, it's, it's quite a cold uh, image. Is, um, caring for another human being is, is an important part of hu um, human bonding, especially caring for the elderly. Uh, it's important for intergenerational bonding as well. But you also mentioned uh, love for robots and projecting human qualities for them. Uh, could you speak a little bit more about the research, the type of research and the pace of research being undertaken to psychologically prepare us to accept robots into the uh, mm. household and perhaps later embracing them into our families? So that's, that's very, very good. Uh, I think the key to the embracing of any technology is time and a gradual approach. Uh, you know, when cars first came out, people thought that they were incredibly unsafe because they went faster than a horse. Uh, and who would imagine that a car could possibly go as fast as they do? Presently, on a two-lane highway with a double yellow line in the middle, we're perfectly happy going, you know, 55 miles an hour with two cars going like this passing within a few feet of each other, which is extraordinary. We trust that the company who built the car, whichever one it is, has built it in such a way, and whoever made the uh, tires, so that we can trust that the car will not suddenly veer into uh, oncoming traffic. I think in a similar way, we're going to come to trust this technology um, along the way. Uh, for example, the goal of having a robot take an elderly person from the bed to the shower and back is a wonderful goal. It's not the right place to start. The right place to start while we're working on that goal is actually products that move around inanimate objects in our home. Uh, many people have them now. The uh, Roomba vacuum cleaner, as an example, is one that has steadily improved and become a very nice addition to homes. We're going to end up with robots doing all sorts of other tasks in our homes that don't involve trusting them with our lives. So they'll clean up after dinner. Uh, they'll organize things, they will uh, order things from some shopping place, whatever that name may be, uh, when we want things. And in fact, you can do that, that now just by talking to them. Uh, and so I think what will happen is sort of the gradual adoption of technology that doesn't begin with this sort of physical safety issue and physical intimacy uh, that you have of a machine carrying you from the bed to the shower. But we'll have all sorts of other machines uh, first. And then gradually we'll trust them to say, I can actually depend on this. Uh, it's, it's amazing when we drive in a car how much we trust it. Uh, 
just think about what you're trusting the car with. Your family's in the back, you're driving along, and uh, you just assume that nothing bad is going to happen. And what's really great is that uh, it's, it's true. Would you hazard a guess about what the next post Roomba robot in the home might be? Uh, so I don't know. Okay. Uh, but I think that's a big question. A, a question up front. Just a couple minutes left. My name is Bob Potter. I come from Dallas. I think your point about trusting the car is certainly very true. We all do. But the important thing is the other driver has to trust his car as much as you do when Absolutely. he's coming towards you. Yes. So that's exactly right. And I'm amazed at that, too. Because we're not only trusting the other car, we are trusting, I have to trust you, right? And, and, uh, and I remember, you know, when I was a little kid going around, you know, for the Boy Scouts selling, you know, little trinkets, you know, to raise money for the Boy Scouts. And I would go into these strangers' homes and, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of strange. And yet every day we go on roads and we completely trust this other human being with our lives. Uh, and, it's, and, it's, and it's great. Uh, I think that we're going to come to trust machines in the same way. There's a question, uh, we have a quick, uh, there's a question on this side, um, gentleman with the dark jacket. You were talking about the, uh, my name is Michael Kasser, I'm from Tucson, Arizona. We were talking about the uh, looking ahead 15 years and planning ahead as far as technology is concerned. Is anybody planning ahead about how society and uh, social evolution over the last 15 years, are you looking into that? I'm sure you are because you're an MIT guy, is that? Yeah, so, well, uh and I'm, I'm lucky, of course, to work with uh, some others at, uh, in, at both MIT and other places that are thinking very deeply about this thing. So this economics group that I mentioned before with McAfee and Brynjolfsson, uh, and many others actually were part of that group, uh, have thought about it a lot. And I think the best thing that's come out of that, that, that group is really the realization that there's two different issues. And so, you know, my, uh, my thinking is, you know, we need to completely accept the fact of the tremendous good these machines can do. But we also have to be cognizant of the fact of the kind of disruption that can happen as a result, the displacement of labor from one field to the other. If it happens slowly, things will be fine. But if it happens fast, we have to figure out how to deal with that too. But to remember that that displacement is about the distribution of wealth through labor and capital, not about the generation of wealth. And there's every reason to embrace the technology for the generation of wealth. And we just have to figure out this other other part. So we're we're out of time. Um, I um, I have a friend in Silicon Valley, Paul Sappho, uh, who's a longtime observer, who likes to say, "Never mistake a clear view for a short distance." And so with that, let's uh, let's thank Gil. <laughs> <you all. laughs>